I'm Laura Shefsack, Scientific Editor at Cell, and I'm here at the 84th Annual Cold Spring Harbor Symposium. This year it's on RNA control and regulation, and I'm talking with Limor Joshua Tor. Hello. Hi. You didn't have to come very far for this no. conference at all, just out your, Easy out your front you. door. Exactly. <laughs> um, so I enjoyed your talk Thank earlier you. this morning. Um, and what, what struck me about it was sort of the way that you needed to bring in your structural biologist. Crystallography is your bread and butter, but you needed to turn to a different approach. Uh -huh. um, and so uh, how did bringing in NMR really let you answer the question you wanted to? Uh, well, we, we don't shy away from other approaches. Okay. We kind of use whatever fits. So, you know, we're now we got into cryo EM and we're having a lot of fun with that as well. But we're going to talk is, about that in a minute. <laughs> this is a teensy little guy, yeah. and so it was uh, it was just natural to to try and do it by NMR. Mm -hmm. um, we chose our collaborator to uh, as somebody that was close because John, who's really the hero of this story, mm -hmm. uh, John Absaro, he wanted to do things himself and mm -hmm. learn himself how to do it. So we wanted somebody nearby. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and so this little protein asterisk. Yeah. As no, not asterisk. Asterix. Yes. <laughs> Remind me what it does. Um, well, we we didn't know when we started. We only knew that it was picked up uh, in these uh, PyRNA screens where uh, both Greg Hannon's lab and Julius Brennecke's lab were looking for f other factors that are involved in the PyRNA pathway. Mm -hmm. And this is one that was very, uh, very clearly uh, giving a, a strong phenotype, mm -hmm. uh, so strong effect. And so, um, but looking at it, it didn't appear very interesting because it just had these two zinc fingers in it and then nothing much else to go on. Um, but uh, that's something we like to do. We like to go after things that are mysterious. Mm -hmm. And so we picked that one to try and figure out um, if we can, with the structure or maybe using the structure, try to tease out uh, some kind of information as to what exactly it does. Um, we did know that it, where in the pathway it works, we knew that it's in the nucleus, mm -hmm. we knew that um, it doesn't affect pyRNA biogenesis, so, uh, so it was pretty clear that it was affecting the, what's called the effector part of the pathway, so probably the silencing step itself. Mm -hmm. Um, but we didn't really know molecularly in detail what it actually did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, so now that you've sort of got a handle on it, um, wh I mean, where do you see the study going sort of in your hands? Um, well, we, we want to see if this really uh, happens. We came up with a model where um, Asterix, uh, we found that it binds these tRNAs, mm -hmm. and we're wondering now um, whether that really uh, is happening. It appears to be the case, and our best guess is that it's, uh, it's binding to, uh, to the primer binding sites on these retrotransposons because that's where tRNA fits into this whole game. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we, there's a little bit of work still to do to, to figure out if, if that's all, uh, it all looks good. But you know, we're really excited about it to see if that's really happening. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think this is a beautiful example where RNAs crop up in places you don't expect them. Yeah, and RNAs get repurposed, and tRNAs fit into so many little niches in biology right. beyond the way we appreciate them in translation. Um, and I guess I wonder: there are other RNAs that have tRNA-like elements to them. Uh huh. Um, I mean, the the data you showed was a pretty specific size, but I wonder if you've You've tried looking at larger things that may have similar structures. I mean, I know your the model is built around tRNA because of the the link to the uh, the retrotransposons. But have you thought about other options? Uh, well, we we were pretty agnostic as okay. to what it would be. So we uh, it was pu co purifying with mm -hmm. the protein initially, and uh, when we first um, uh, looked at it and found that it was a tRNA. You know the way we expressed the protein was a mouse protein in this insect mm -hmm. called armyworm. It's a moth, uh, and so we weren't sure that it's relevant at all. Right. And so that's why we went. Uh, we looked for 
uh, what the mouse protein would pull out in mouse cells that have mm -hmm. pi RNAs and the Drosophila one in, 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 in cells that are ov uh, ovary cells uh, that also uh, are part of the pathway to see if it's still doing that. And it appears to pick up tRNAs very mm -hmm. specifically. It's not fragments. You know, fragments are, are all over the place, but this appears to be a full tRNA. Okay, that was going to be my other question. Yeah, is, yeah. And is the, is the protein restricted to germline? Yes, okay. yes, it appears so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and so, the, I mean, this was, this was a, a small protein. Yeah. Uh, we were talking earlier that you've sort of jumped into the world of cryo-EM. Right. Um, which also has problems with small things. Right. Um, so I'm curious what kinds of questions you want to answer now in the kind of RNA space that you haven't been able to do before because you didn't have you know, crystals or another approach. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of things that you can now do with cryo-EM yeah. uh, because, um, uh, because you don't have to produce crystals, uh, you need to make really good s sample that's okay. fairly clean but it doesn't have to have quite, it's not quite the same bar as mm -hmm. when you want to actually crystallize it. And also, uh, we have a little bit more leeway in terms of conformational flexibility mm -hmm. of the molecules, where, whereas in, in crystallography, you kind of can't do it. So we have, uh, we have uh, another system that we've been working on for a while, which is um, the tutases mm -hmm. uh, with respect to their um, biogenesis and destruction of uh, an important microRNA called LET7. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, for example, um, uh, we can now assemble these complexes and they might have conformational flexibility, but we don't have to like uh, cut off all the extra loops and mm -hmm. things like that. We can deal with it uh, because you can computationally purify out mm -hmm. the different complexes. So uh, it opened up a lot of possibilities for us. Um, uh, you know, we're interested both in that, we're interested, uh, I've, I've started my career in, in RNA and RNA interference with Argonaut and mm -hmm. uh, that also factors into our uh, studies, uh, but the pi RNA pathway um, is, is probably the most intriguing because there are a lot of factors that have been uh, shown to be uh, part of this pathway, but we don't. We heard about some more of those today. That's right, yeah. and we know where they fit in and a little bit of, of what they do, but how they do it mm -hmm. and uh, mechanistically how they do it, we don't. And so uh, this is an opportunity for us to jump in and, uh, and, and figure out some stuff that would be interesting. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm curious now that, now that you've sort of gone in this, well actually, let's back up. So in order to be able to do cryo-EM, you told me something interesting the other day that you essentially went back to school. Yep. <laughs> so what did, you, what did you have to do to sort of bring the technology on board? Uh, well, there, there, well, first of all, we had to get a microscope. Okay. So um, Bruce Tillman, who is the president of Cold Spring Harbor, was very generous in raising the money to mm -hmm. get a microscope, which is fantastic. Um, uh, but then, uh, yeah, so before that, uh, we, um, I, there are a lot of videos online that uh, about 70 hours at least of mm -hmm. practical videos mm -hmm. on, on the technique which I watched. Uh, there, um, we started a cryo-EM course at Cold Spring Harbor which I was a huge advocate for and I was student number one in the <laughs> course. <laughs> and I went in and, 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 and just took it full on, mm -hmm. um, practical and computational mm -hmm. and everything. Um, and, uh, and people in my lab uh, really bought into it. They're all really excited about it. We've been going to courses uh, all around the world and, uh -huh. uh, and, uh, and, and, and mostly um, just doing it and getting advice from people. So uh, it's really fun to, at this stage, learn something really new and, and, and so powerful too. So. so are you actually going to be in the lab solving a structure? Well, or do you uh, want to be able to just... I want to be able advise. to, yeah, advise. I want to be able to be, more importantly, advise and also be critical of mm -hmm. what people are doing because if I don't know all the the little issues that mm -hmm. come along, then I don't think I, you know, I'd be able to do either of those. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I wish I could. Um, I don't think people in my lab would let me <laughs> even do it. But um. I think one of the issues that has struck me about cryo, as, as more and more people are doing it, um, it's different from crystallography in that the community hasn't yet agreed on set standards. 
That's the way right. that you know you had you know our free and our work and like all the statistics in crystallography that let your peers assess the quality of the structure. Yeah. Um, and so, as someone who is coming into the the technique, um, when you sort of look at the quality of the structures out there, how you think about working with the data, do you think that cryoEM is going to get to a point where there are those kinds of agreed upon metrics, or just because of the nature of the technique, it's always going to be, um, I don't know, more not, descriptive is the wrong word, but there will be different metrics, and people will have different opinions about. About uh, well, I, I know. I, I think it's just a matter of time and uh, development because um, I'm going to age myself. But when I started with crystallography, we also didn't have a lot of the quality controls that okay. we have today. Uh, so we had uh, more primitive ones, mm -hmm. and uh, now we're uh, we're very careful about it. We have all these uh, uh, these ways of uh, of quality control and assessing structures. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing, and, and the reason it's going to happen way faster in cryo-EM, not only because uh, there's more people, the computational techniques are a lot more sophisticated and all of that, but also all of us crystallographers are jumping into yeah. cryo-EM. And so I think we bring in uh, these traditions mm -hmm. into cryo-EM. So I think um, they'll have no choice and just, um, you know, this is all going to be developed and I think not in too long of a time. Just a matter of to, to, to find ways of doing this properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, is X-ray crystallography done? No. Okay. So what? <laughs> good. So what are the kinds of questions that are where that's going to remain the the premier technique, and and, and how are those distinct from the kinds of questions you use cryo for or you use NMR for? Like, looking forward. Well, uh, so so first of all, NMR um, is good for for certain uh, small things, but but it is very good for looking at dynamics, right. which we really can't do at all, really, in crystallography, uh, and we can't do as well in cryo EM. Um, crystallography um, is really good at getting very high resolution structures, uh, and I think that uh, the field of uh, of uh, drug design and drug development is still going to uh, uh, enjoy uh, enjoy um, what crystallography has to do. Um, it's true that in cryo EM we're getting uh, we we're able to look at smaller and smaller things mm -hmm. at, at very high resolution, uh, but those are things that are um, very well behaved, etc. Uh, so yes, you also need the well behaved for crystallography, but um, it's still um, uh, so powerful and the technique is so streamlined now in mm -hmm. crystallography, uh, especially for small things and for, uh, and for looking at complexes with drugs, mm -hmm. uh, that I think that it still has a place. And, and again, with small things, um, um, for example, um, Argonaut we can do on the cryo yam, but it, we know how to crystallize it and it looks so, so good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so why, you know, why do it? In a, why make our lives more complicated if we can use crystallography? So. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about cryo and the, the possibilities that it opens for the kinds of complexes that you work on, you've, you've mentioned a couple of times that you need a good sample. Yes. Um, and so how does the biology, like understanding the biology, fit in sort of the, the integration between the biology and the structure? Because it seems to me that you need to know something about the biology in order to be able to prepare a sample that Correct. would be useful, and then that will tell you more about you know that's that, right that process. So, how does it look on the front end? Um, well, I mean, we uh, it, it's just um, it's just practical because uh, you know we have to know how to how uh, what to do to our sample to coax mm -hmm. it in a way. Uh, that would be uh, that it would like to be in, mm -hmm. and so whether uh, in many cases it's adding the right partners, uh, whether it's uh, small ligands, but importantly also mm -hmm. big partners, and if we don't understand uh, how it associates with them and what it likes to look at, what pieces of RNA it likes to look at, and things like that, um, you know, it, our job would be much harder. Mm -hmm. um, there's a fantastic description in. Uh, Barry Worth's book uh, called The Billion Dollar Molecule, oh, yeah. and there he says uh, for, for crystallization, he says it, but I think it's for every sample that you have to 
bathe it in the right amniotic fluid so they okay. will feel good about uh, about themselves so <laughs> I like that I, li I like that and so I'm, I'm, I'm curious when you you sort of think about your career and you know what's ahead are there are there questions that you wanted to ask about biological systems in the past that you, you couldn't get around that you now think about going back to? Um, well, I mean, specifically with the discussion we were just having with cryo -EM, yeah. yes. Uh, we've been working on, uh, for example, on a helicase where uh, it assembles uh, into different states and each state uh, controls a different part of the maturation into a helicase mm -hmm. from, from, uh, from binding double-stranded DNA to melting uh, double-stranded DNA to translocating on DNA. And we can get at a couple of these states before, but we couldn't get at one crucial one uh, because uh, it, uh, we couldn't make enough and we thought it might be too unstable and just not amenable for crystallizations. And now we're going for it, so, okay. so yeah, uh, that's one example. Uh -huh. um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, uh, any of these complexes that are, are bigger and unwieldy and things like that that we were thinking about in the past, uh, we actually have a couple in our freezer that we just had very small amounts of and we, you know we didn't know what to chop off exactly that would give us more uh, expression that we're, we're taking out of the freezer now so uh, yeah yeah it's, it's and this is part of the pyrene pathway actually okay. so okay. Uh, yeah that's what I like the idea of freezer science where it's like well couldn't couldn't use it then maybe <laughs> yeah. we can use it now um, so I want to ask you just one last question which sure. has to do with sort of bringing new students into into this field like what what is the what are the things that you think students should know or be excited about or be aware of when they're getting into structural biology now oh uh, gosh I haven't thought of it I, I mean to me I don't know how you can live without it because uh, you know seeing exactly what things look like uh, is so informative to how they work, and mm -hmm. I've uh, that happened uh, uh, very clearly in, a, in 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 several cases in my career. So uh, I just uh, can't live with just blobs in a cartoon. You know, it just doesn't do it for me enough. I mean, you can go back to the blobs, but then you are informed by what mm -hmm. the structures are telling you about how things actually work, and. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a chemist at heart and mm -hmm. in training, and so uh, I always go back to the exact mechanisms. And um, uh, I think there are a lot of people out there that still that really floats their boat, mm -hmm. and that's kind of their cup of tea, and all these other uh, <laughs> uh, and and uh, and, and, and um, so they'll they'll just come, and they are coming. Um, I also I have to say that. There's such an aesthetic about structural biology that, um, uh, yeah, I mean, the imaging techniques now that are producing these wonderful images, but there's such an aesthetic about look at, about the molecules themselves mm -hmm. that um, I hope uh, people are still excited about it, so. Oh, I'm sure they are. <laughs> well, thank you very much. This has been a fun chat. Yes, well, for me too. Thank you. Good.